Good evening, General Aviation Aficionados. Welcome to another edition of Ask an Ambassador with the superior character that starts with Kay Sundrum out on the West Coast in California, Pat Brown in the central United States, nestled into the heart of Texas, and Jamie Beckett. I'm here in Florida with the worst internet connection ever seen by man since Dixie Cups and Strings. I'm doing my best, but what can I tell you? As always, we have a spectacular producer for this show, not Donnie McKay. I know you are fans of Donnie McKay's and the Donnie McKay fan club probably tuned in and they're wearing their Donnie t-shirts and stuff, but no, we upgraded to Rebecca Boone this time because Donnie has a tendency to broadcast from the basement of a hardened structure underneath Mount, um, whatever that mountain is where the presidents are. Um, Rebecca, on the other hand, has style. She is in that cab way up top in the Eiffel Tower so she can see out across Paris. And she has excellent internet because it just radiates out in every direction. So everything good that happens tonight is because of Rebecca. Everything bad that happens is because of my crappy internet. But from there, we move on. Our topic tonight is going to be flight bags. And it seems to perhaps that flight bags are not a very respectable topic, but you know, They've gone from where people just, pilots just stuff things in their pockets. And then they eventually loaded them into burlap bags. And eventually they developed a little bit of style and have a leather satchel. But there's just more and more and more stuff. And we thought, what do you have in your flight bag? Well, let's find out. We'll tell you what we have in our flight bag. And of course, as always, you can ask any question you want on any topic. And I see we've already got people... Frazier Watt from Edinburgh, UK. I mean, this is international, folks, right off the bat. I like it. Alex Rizzo, hi right back to you. Waleed, good evening to you. We've got just great. Oh, first question from Cavalier 102.5. What are wings credits? How are they collected? And what are they good for? I, I think that's three questions, Cavalier. Pat, you want to try that one? What are wings credits? Wings credits are offered by the FAA through the Wings program. If you go to faasafety.gov, that's the website, faasafety.gov, you can read all about the details. And there's actually an advisory circular that you can look up. I can't recall the, uh, the name or the number of the advisory circular, but you can, if, you do, if you Google Wings Credit Advisory Circular, you'll get a, a text uh, uh, written a PDF about what it is, but essentially it's a, a way that you can uh, enjoy ongoing training. And if you participate fully in the WINGS program, you, they, it actually will work in place of a flight review. So there are some really cool things that, uh, that you can use those WINGS credit for. Uh, you can get WINGS credit for uh, attending um, uh, safety seminars, either live or online, assuming that they qualify for WINGS credit. Uh, you can also get wings credit for doing various flying uh, exercises, and they loosely align with the private and commercial uh, 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 Airman Certification Standards, or ACS. And it starts with basic and goes to uh, advanced and up to master. Everybody starts at basic. You can stay at basic for the entire time if you like, or you can advance to master. Either one is fine. At any time, you can go back down to basic. Very, very easy um, and they, the advisory circular at faasafety.gov will tell you clearly uh, what you need to do. So I hope that helps. Yeah, I just uh, I just did a safety meeting this past Saturday that I presented on go, no, go decision making. It's as simple as that. I mean, somebody else has set it up and they've got credits. All you have to do is go. If you have that account online, it's automatic. Thank you, Pat. That was very, that was very all inclusive. I should have known that. Um, We've got Doug Miller saying, hey, from Dallas-Fort Worth, Don Jones from SAT. I did not do well on the SATs. Kay, I'm imagining you did, but I, I was not an excellent student. And Eric Pittman, and I have to say, I had uh, a lengthy telephone conversation with Eric Pittman, who I think we can count as an actual fan at this point. Um, he comes all the time. But we had a great conversation. Eric is potentially shopping for an airplane. So good luck oh. to you, Eric. Yeah, now, Eric we, is a I'm sorry, Eric is either a fan or a stalker. I'm not sure at this point. Oh, it's a fine line. It really is. And Ryan just popped in from Ohio, birthplace of aviation. 
Ryan, thanks for being here. We are talking about flight bags tonight. And, you know, truthfully, flight bag is not just a piece of luggage. There is a term or well, an expression that I think is worthwhile to remember. In an emergency, especially in an unplanned water landing, if it's not attached to you, it's probably not leaving the aircraft. So having a well-organized flight bag that literally has everything you need to make a successful flight and maybe survive a not so successful flight. We're going to talk about it tonight. Kay, what's like the number one item for you in a flight bag? And, and it can go in any direction you want, whether it's a simplistic thing like extra batteries or whether it's a complex thing like a nuclear reactor to run your coffee maker. What's number one for you? I would say that it is my knee board because it houses a lot of things. So I carry an iPad mini, and in fact, I, I basically took my flight bag and put it on all the items on my desk here. But I, I find that having a knee board with the clipboard, and uh, you can have your checklist and paper and make sure that you have your pen and that it is attached, because I guarantee you at some point in your flying experience, you're going to drop the pen and you're not going to be able to find it or you're not going to have a second one or a third one that's easily accessible. And so I just used a sunglass, uh, one of those little little strings, and I attached it to one end of the clipboard and the other on the pen. And the back of the pen, it has one of those soft uh, you know, tips that I can use on the touch screen or on my iPad. And so I find this really helpful um, because it's everything in one place and nothing's going to be sliding around. And it doesn't matter what device you're using, whether it's an iPad mini, it's a full size, or if you have an Android or an iPhone, just make sure that it's something that you can access easily and it's secure. I know we're going to be talking about that a little bit more, but that's one of my key items. But the I want to say a second item, if that's okay. Uh, if for me, it's a sunglasses. So <laughs> I know you might be thinking part of the flight bag is not for when you go to the beach, but I absolutely need this because when you come into land, and trust me, come over to Palomar and try to land during sunset, it's basically an IFR approach. Mm -hmm. You can't see anything. And if you don't have your sunglasses with you, um, you're going to be crying. You Literally, you're going to be crying uh, because of the sun just right in your eyes. And so that's a must-have. And this is a dedicated pair that I keep in my flight bag. It never leaves my flight bag. Uh, yeah. So I got one in the car and other places, but that's a must-have. But uh, the main one is the knee board. I find that really helpful. There is a strap that goes on the back of this particular one. I don't have it here because I just came off of a an airline flight a couple of days ago, and I don't need to strap that on my leg when I'm on my airline flight, so I took that off. But another component of this that I like is that it can swivel Um some boards don't allow you to do that, to rotate from horizontal to portrait, and I find that really helpful. So, I love the, the comment on the pen being attached, and I'll tell you, I have a friend who's a, a captain with one of the majors, has been for years, but we went to flight school together, and he was on his multi-engine check ride and dropped his pen after he had started the takeoff roll, and he just bent down to pick it up. And he successfully did. And when he looked up, he was right on the edge of the runway, about to go off. And it's like, never doing that again. <laughs> After that, just let the pen go. Pat, how about you? What's what's your number one go-to thing that just, I'm not leaving the house without it? Well, you know, I, boy, I'll tell you, if I had to, to, to choose one, it would be really difficult. But um, handy-dandy iPad, for certain. Mm -hmm. And um, handy dandy headset. Um, those probably are the two that I'm for sure not going to leave the house without. Um, if I'm flying at night, you know, got yeah. a flashlight. And there's there. I mean, there are other things, but but um, the the two absolute must-haves um, are are going to be the iPad and uh, and the headset. Now I do have in the airplane uh, a small book. Um, uh, um, that uh, w with pencil and paper, essentially, uh, because, uh, you know, one of our viewers here said something about it. There's a lot to be said for uh, flying uh, with pencil and paper. I, that's out of where I can read the comments at this point. But and I agree. Um, but um, primarily it's going to be um, the iPad and the headset. Yeah, I like that. And, you know, I'm a, a what up guy. So, as you know, Pat, a knife. 
And we actually bought this knife together in Houston because I had to fly commercial to Houston, couldn't take it with me, and had to go buy another one. But I'm a big one because the flight bag not only has all the tools you need for navigation, communication, survival, whatever, and, and even food. I mean, let's face it, there's not a beverage service in the 152. I suspect there's not in your airplanes either. So you kind of bring things with you. You know, th this has never happened before, but K is so popular. We have all these comments to catch up on. Bob Gardner is saying hello from Tennessee. Hello, Bob Gardner. I'm, I'm going to assume you're involved in the music industry because you're in Tennessee. That just seems reasonable. Frazier Watt wants to know how we feel about the electronic flight bag, which is more of a logbook thing. Okay, you have a preference, paper, plastic, or electronic? It's mainly electronic, but I'm not 100% uh, digital. And so here's why. One, number one, I, I think that we've come a long, long way with technology in the cockpit, particularly with electronic flight bags and the use of the, the iPad and uh, other you know devices and and, and if, when I say iPad I'm sorry if you're using an Android or other devices those are perfectly fine whatever floats your boat um, I just like it because the situational awareness is stellar with these electronic devices now you do need to know how to use them properly and learning them or trying to learn them in the airplane is an awful place it's very inefficient the airplane is not the place where you want to learn how to use those devices but i have an, an ipad mini and i splurged at the beginning of this year for the the latest i was waiting for the latest ipad to come out and i did get that uh and then my backup is my my iphone now, i already showed you how my ipad mini is on my kneeboard and then my um my phone is on this little uh little gadget here that's a suction mount and uh i find that to be a nice backup because if you are going digital, which is great, and I highly encourage that, you got to backup, backup, backup. Because mm -hmm. if you're not going to carry those paper charts and then your battery dies, and I promise you one day your iPad will overheat or you're going to run out of battery, you don't get that nine hours as marketing advertises. It's going to be a fraction of that. You're going to get to a situation where you don't have um, an electronic device, and that's why you need to have a backup to a backup. So I do fly with that primarily. However, I have two exceptions. I do still hold the instrument approach procedures. Um, and I use this little uh, organizer and, and I'm not here to market any, any company. I don't care what you use, but I, I like this one just because of the way it's organized by your departure destination and alternate. And I just put those in there. I, I'm not giving this up. I'm just not giving the instrument charts up. And then the other one that I hold on to is the Los Angeles TAC chart, the terminal area chart, because I am in the busiest airspace. And there are a number of transition routes here. And you don't want to memorize that. And it's a little hard to find it on the electronic version. Yes, it can be done, but it's just easier to just snatch that, that TAC chart. So those are the only two items that I keep paper. And I'm digital the rest of the way. You know, Pat, as we talk about this topic, I think one of the things we have to be honest about is if your flight bag weighs three pounds, you're doing it wrong. You don't have everything you need. On the other hand, if your flight bag weighs 100 pounds, you're doing it wrong. You don't need to bring all that with you. It really is necessary to be somewhat judicious and think about what am I taking and why am I taking it and what do I need for that exact reason, just so we don't end up carrying an enormous amount of weight and, and frankly, then we're just bringing all the clutter from home with us. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. You know, when I when I first started, uh, after, well, after I got my instrument rating, it's really when it kind of started. Uh, I started throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, in a, in a, uh, in a gym bag. And uh, it was one of those uh, champion gym bags you throw over your shoulder like a, like, a, like a duffel bag. And it was enormous. And relatively speaking, it was just enormous. And then, uh, oh, several years ago, I guess, uh, I went to uh, Oshkosh and I saw a flight bag. It was a brand new design by a company called Brightline. I don't think they're in business anymore, but I really liked the, the uh, modular construction and the fact you could add zipper pouches and things like that to it. And so I bought the basic model. 
And I took it back to the house that night and, and, and started really going through it. What can I, what can I really get rid of out of this, this, uh, you know, this, this, this gym bag. And it, it forced me to make some decisions. What I really need versus what, what's kind of extraneous and I'll never use have it that I've never used before. I'll probably never use since. And that kind of, that kind of uh, helped me to, to solidify the, the must haves, including a Leatherman, you know, there's some things I don't have here on my desk, but I've got a Leatherman, um, you know, various, some flashlights, a couple of small flash, little small flashlights that work on one or two uh, uh, AA batteries or, or, or AAA batteries, depending. Mm-hmm. Um, just, there's a lot of little stuff like that. But boy, I tell you what, it really made me uh, get a little, a little bit more disciplined about it. So, um, yeah, it, it's important. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Let me catch up on comments here. Bob Gardner says, my late father was one of the founders of the Damn Yankee Air Force. That is cool. I've never heard of the Damn Yankee Air Force, but it seems appropriate that it would be in Tennessee. (laughs) And, you know, I I used to work up near Jacksonville many years ago, and I knew a guy because I have this accent, and he, he pointed out the difference between a Yankee and a Damn Yankee is a Yankee goes home again. So now we've got that. Frazier Watts says, hey, I like your knee board. And see, you have fans. I like that. Uh, Eric Pittman, being disrespectful as Eric Pittman often is, flight bag, not beach bag. Laugh out loud. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, uh, Bob says the name was an homage to the Confederate Air Force. Thank you. I, I literally never heard of the damn Yankee Air Force. I think that's cool. I'll have to look it up. Doug Miller, to Kay's point about sunglasses, says his are on his head but he's a backup pair in his flight bag. Hey, that's that redundancy thing you were talking about. Have two of a lot. I actually do fly with three knives usually because you can drop them. You know, things happen. Yeah. Air J has a great question for Pat. Do you take an updated sectional chart with you along with your iPad? And I know, Pat, you've, you've got history with this. The, the simple answer is no. <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> no, I, I mean, honestly, I was, I was a slow adopter. I mean, really a slow adopter of electronic flight bags. I have a very, very good friend who bought a Kindle years and years ago. Remember the Kindle? And, um, and he showed up at the airport one day and he said, look at this Kindle. He said, I've got all these approach plates on, the, on this Kindle. And I thought, you know, yeah, right. What if the battery dies? What if, what if, what if? And, uh, and even after iPad, the, uh, the four flight came out, um, I, I was a very, very slow adopter. Um, and then I tried it and started to realize that uh, this is really pretty cool. And, um, uh, you know, for, I mean, I'm not telling anybody anything they already know, but on my iPad, uh, I mean, I can select, choices that give me every single sectional chart in the entire United States, every tack chart in the United States, the, uh, the, uh, the FARS, the AIM, uh, uh, the, the chart supplement, every approach plate, every arrival and departure, every low altitude or high altitude, if I want in route charts, um, they can all go on my iPad. Um, I don't choose to use them all because uh, the uh, I don't fly in 100% of the geographic part of the United States, so I, I only use typically in memory what what I what I know I'm going to be flying in. Um, just it's just it's faster that way. But uh, um, I, I haven't carried paper. I'll, I'll bet it's been 14, 15 years since I've actually carried a, a paper chart. Now for a while. I did what uh, what Kay does, and that is carry your backup paper approach plates, and um, and I still don't think that's a, a bad uh, a bad practice. I don't I just don't do it. Um, I, between um, the uh, the GPS database and the moving map on the panel of the airplane, and uh, two iPads, and I carry an Android, but I've got a a, a program an app for that. Um, that uh, that can serve as a backup. Um, if all of that stuff goes dead, including the GPS and plates on the on the uh, on the in panel equipment in the airplane, I got bigger problems than not having a paper chart in the airplane. So I just I just don't do it. 
I love that logic. That absolutely works for me. Absolutely. And uh, Waleed has sent us a message that I'm sure is insightful, but it appears to be in French, and I do not speak French. I can get into trouble in German, so I will say, Ich verstehe nichts, dude. Ich verstehe nichts. Um, Eric Pittman has redundancy in his flight bag, and I believe him. I think Eric Pittman took K seriously. Um, Cavalier won a 2.5, uses backup battery that powers everything, and an extra night day light. That's a great idea because, you know, that, that flashlight is one of those things you can forget, okay? And I, I suspect it happens out in your end of the country, too. It's a beautiful evening. It, it's an hour and a half to sunset, and you're just going to go for a short flight. And one thing leads to another, and before you know it, you're night flying, and you didn't bring a flashlight with you. Boy, can that be uncomfortable, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It's good to have more than one flashlight, too, because you, if you don't use it all the time, it, it it may not work that one time that you need it. So have a backup. And, and I know, I think, Pat, you had, when we were talking, you said you like the one that mounts on your head. Um, yeah. I am not a fan of that. I know a lot of people use that. Uh, it's a hairstyle I mean, thing, Kay. Oh, it, it, it's totally a hairstyle thing. <laughs> I like this one that clips onto the belt. And uh, it has that gooseneck on so you can angle it. But my backup is actually a part of my battery pack. So you can have that as a, as a flashlight also. And now this is my more heavy duty battery pack. I have a smaller one, but it's good to have these uh, redundancies and don't have two of the same item. Uh, you can couple them up and it, it saves uh, weight and space in your flight bag. Plus, if, like Jamie, you said earlier, if you got a ton of stuff, you're that one item that you need is going to be hard to find. So be wise about what you do carry so that's easy to find in flight. Yeah, that, that can be undervalued because if you've got all that stuff in your bag, but you're trying to fly the airplane and talk on the radio and something's going on and you're reaching behind the seat, it can be tough. But, Pat, I knew you had something to say, and I cut you off. I apologize. Well, no, no, no. I will never forgive myself. Please go. No, no. Well, I mean, everything that you say is such insight, Jamie. I would, I didn't want to uh, interrupt you either. Uh, but no, you know, I was uh, talking about flashlights. I was probably one of the four or five people that bought the AKG headset when it first came about at six or seven years ago. It was competing with Bose and Lightspeed. And there were some things I liked about it and some things that I, that I don't like. But one of the things that I really did like that, boy, I, I would love to see Bose and, head, and, and uh, Lightspeed and some of the others incorporate is, and this is a, this is a Bose headset, but, but right, 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 right here on each earpiece on the AKG are, are little white lights. And they're very, very dim, but just enough to give you some illumination in the cockpit. And because, it, you know, because it runs off batteries as well as ships power, if you want, if you do lose power, you, you've got you've got a, a headset mounted flashlight that you can that you can turn off with, on with a power pack. And it's it's probably the only thing that I really like a lot about that particularly particular headset. And it's too bad it went out of business, but it sure would be nice if Bose would fix that. Bose, are you listening? They really. Oh, and by the way, just let me say one more thing about Eric Pittman and redundancy. He is the ultimate in redundancy. He has two T's in his name. He has redundant T's. I worry about you sometimes, Pat. I really do. <laughs> hey, I'm really excited here because Christopher Ritchie actually answered the question I asked at the beginning somewhat rhetorically, but he took it seriously. He actually listed what he's got in his flight bag. So we're going to touch on that in a minute. But I have to say, Christopher Ritchie, you're getting this hat in the mail if you send your address to ambassadors at AOPA.org because you actually answered the question. And I have to tell you, this is the greatest pilot hat you will ever have because right there at the top of the hat, no button. <laughs> so these are made special with no button, so the headset does not hurt your head. These are fantastic. So I encourage you, ambassadors at AOPA.org, write to us, Christopher. Give us an address, and I'll pop this in the mail to you. And don't even think about pretending you're Christopher Ritchie. We'll know. Um, so, Christopher, Pat, this is, this is up your alley. He carries a personal locator beacon. I didn't use it to. You do and got me to do it. That's it right there. Tell us the story. Why did you start carrying one of those? Yeah, oh, Kay's, got, Kay, okay. Kay's got one too. Kay's got one too. Well, it really, it really started from uh, 
several years ago, I was in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, doing a, an Air Safety Institute seminar, and it happens to be the ACR is located in Fort Lauderdale, and they were sponsoring the event, and they invited me down to a tour of the factory. And uh, and by the way, they did not give me this. I actually bought it uh, when I got home from that, that seminar run. Uh, but uh, they were talking about uh, the number of saves that they've had um, but with people that have had to um, de uh, deploy that, that thing. And part of the safety seminar had to do with 121.5 megahertz ELTs versus the 40, uh, 40, uh, 406 megahertz ELT. And the fact that, um, that if, if you fire this thing off uh, within seven minutes, um, the agency that monitors this thing will know that you're that you have some some sort of an issue seven minutes and of course it'll take them a little time to notify the agency that's closest to where they think you are based on this but this will take somebody uh to with what they advertise with 100 meters of where where you are but it's in reality it's much much closer than that there was a cessna 206 that went down in alaska on a frozen lake a year or two ago and uh almost within the hour rescue was there on the lake picking those people up and it had to do specifically with the fact that they had a 406 megahertz elt so i'm i'm a huge believer in those things and i carry it with me yeah i, I like that as well and uh, christopher also mentions the handheld aviation radio which eric Pittman asked should they have a backup i don't think you need two but i do carry one and i have the plugs on it so i can just my radio fails i can just go ahead and unplug from the panel and plug into the handheld i've only needed it a couple times ever but you know what if you need it and you don't have it you'll be aware of that problem so yes Kay, tell us a story i know i just wanted to add on to the uh to pat's comment about the plb so i got uh, in fact i have the same one that you have pat and i am in need of replacing the battery it's uh, five years yeah. and you gotta change the battery it's almost worth just buying a new one because the battery's approximately the same cost of the unit itself. But uh, the reason I picked this up is I saw the Air Safety Institute uh, seminar called Survival After the Crash. And if you have not seen it, uh, please do. It will be well worth your time. Uh, it's not even an hour long, I think. And when I saw that a few years ago, that prompted me to buy this because I do fly over some hostile terrain. And even though I have the ELT, there's, there's no saying that I'm going to stay with the airplane. And so that seminar, Survival After the Clash, talked about what equipment you should have, not your flight bag, but if you have to make an off-field landing, what you should have. So please uh, take some time and watch that. Uh, it will be well worth it. Yeah, I actually like that a lot. You know, one of the things I carry in my flight bag is a space blanket, partially because I live near the Space Coast. It makes me feel like an astronaut. But... <laughs> Seriously, these if you're in a cold weather climate, these actually do work. They reflect body heat back in. And um, if you're down in a, a very sunny climate where I am, they also keep you from getting sunburned. But the great thing about something like this is you can tell through the bag, it's, it's a gold color. It's very reflective. If you're on the ground and are trying to be found, it's a fairly large reflector that makes you much easier to find so that's just one of those weird little things that you can have in your bag it takes up very little space it doesn't weigh much at all i'll probably never need it but if i do it's there and Kay, i want to come back to you with this one because martin castlebaum is saying i've got the same canned oxygen that Kay has very handy now i live on a sandbar if i get above a thousand feet something's wrong but you live out in mountainous territory. That's actually a useful item, isn't it? Yes, this is this is really important. So in one of the planes I have, I do have oxygen. But um, in the 172, for example, if I'm going to go up to to Big Bear or across the uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, I I like to have this with me because I do have an oximeter. I don't have that on my desk here because that's actually in the airplane. And if my oxygen level goes below about 91%, especially 90%, I like to take just two puffs of that. And, and then I'm back up to, you know, 98, 99%. And I, I just, uh, I don't want to say I feel better. I just don't want to know how I will be if I'm below that uh, 80, 88 to 86%. Now, some folks, uh, they operate just fine, but you really have to know how your body reacts. And so I find that I need 
very lightweight. It always feels like it's empty, right? It's oxygen. And so it's not going to add weight to your, your, your flight bag, but make sure that you keep it handy. Uh, you don't want to have it all the way back in the back seat and where you can't reach it. So that's another important thing uh, is accessibility. Let, let me know in the comments, viewers, how many of you carry a handheld radio and how many of you carry oxygen like Pat, or like Kay and, um, and Martin? And I'm sorry, Pat, you and Kay look so similar. Sometimes I get the names wrong. I do that with my kids, too, and, and they're male and female. I, I can't explain it. It's just it's a problem I have. Pat, Ryan is asking, are satellite phones worth it? He personally does not carry one. I don't either, but I do know people who do. Do you have an opinion one way or the other on a satellite phone? You know, honestly, I don't. I, I've, I've never used one. I've never owned one. I, I wouldn't know. I, I wouldn't know how to, how to begin with one other than to probably have to read the instructions. So I, I don't really know. Uh, I, don't okay. know. I, don't, I don't have an opinion on that. Cecilia Adamson has come up with an interesting comment. An old CD and some glow sticks can help with being located. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, my dad was an Air Force pilot, and he had this little shiny piece of metal that was about the size of a pack of cigarettes or a playing card, and it had a little hole in the center. And you would use it to, to flash a signal to something. You could look through the hole. You know, a CD would work absolutely well. And, you know, I don't carry a CD in my bag, and it's probably not a bad idea. Cecilia, that's a great one. I like that a lot. Really good. Now, Kay, you actually have your flight bag there in the office with you, don't you? I do. Now, Pat is a slacker. He did not bring his. He brought everything in it, but he didn't bring the flight bag. Can we see yours, and, and what what's it look like as a, oh, as right. a piece of luggage? Here it is. So this is actually my second flight bag. I, I, I'll show you the first one. Um, so here it is. There's lots of zippers. There's actually four uh, big zippers, and then there's two small ones on the side. So I put my batteries in here um, because I can easily reach that. And then I have um, glasses on the side here. And so it's very, very useful with all the different pockets. I'm not going to open up all of that, but you get the point. There's four big zippers and two small ones and a bunch of little uh, pockets. Now, this is the one that I had uh, before, and I had this for a long time. And as you can see, it's kind of modular like the way that Pat mentioned before, where you can put your headset and uh, spare. And um, I like this one a lot. In fact, I, I actually like this one better in terms of being able to find things because there's a big open um, you know, rectangular shape in the middle, and you can put sectionals inside and kind of uh, size it the way you want. But the reason I don't carry this one is because it does get a little heavy, and the backpack is easier as I'm walking out to some of the rental airplanes when I'm instructing, and I'm just kind of lazy, and that backpack it just is easier to carry, which is why I switched to, to that one. But um, it, it's just important that you have something that you can put all your gear, and it's easy to get to, and I find that the more compartments, the better, because you know where things are, provided that you're putting things back in the same exact spot. And I don't let anybody touch my flight bag or use my equipment. Uh, it's just something that I use for flight, and I want to know that it hasn't been dropped and things are put back in the same spot. So I'm, I'm, a, little, uh, I'm a little selfish on that piece. I don't share any of that equipment. I don't let my family touch my flight bag, and I know where everything is. So. That seems very wise to me. And, you know, I've been in this business like 108 years. So when I started, flight bags were big, bulky leather cases with a double flap. And the smart pilots started putting them on little rollers. And, and that just seemed like too much trouble to me. So I did exactly what you did. I switched to a, a bag, really. And it works great for me because it's got a million compartments. It's got a handle on the top. But it is a backpack, so it's got shoulder straps. If I have to walk a long ways from the airport to the hotel or the cab stand or whatever, it's not a big deal. But I have pens and pads in here for making notes. I have my headsets in here. I have extra batteries in here. Uh, in the back, I can actually store uh, battery chargers for phones or iPad or whatever. You know, I got to admit, I never thought early on that something as basic as a backpack could be 
personalized for pilots and be really handy. And the great thing about it is if I go away on an overnight, there's enough space in that main pocket there that I can actually take a change of clothes and a shaving kit and I'm, I'm good to go. So, you know, they've come a long way, but I really think maybe one of the most important tools a pilot has at their disposal is a flight bag. And what you put in it is a personal choice, but like Cecilia Adamson, handheld, yeah, but have a good working knowledge of that handheld because they're not all the same. And if it has a feature, you know, Pat, uh, Kay, to your point, I did it again, Pat K. Kay. Kay, to your point, like if I've got the tablet and I have ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or whatever, but I don't know how to use it, it really wasn't helpful to have that at all. That's, that's, that's all I got. That's my whole point. <laughs> Well, you know, Jamie, if uh, I can add to that, uh, you should please. actually take a class on how to use those apps if you're using ForeFlight or mm. Garmin Pilot or Wingx, and you don't need a flight instructor for that. You can go onto their website, or if you go come out to any of the the air shows, all of those uh, manufacturers have uh, pretty large uh, exhibits, and they have seminars, and they have people there that that can uh, just walk you through things. And those seminars are great. Um, in fact, if you have, even if you're new to using the iPad, go to the Apple store and take their class. Uh, it's about one hour long and you will learn even from one generation to another. This buttons are in different places. Shortcuts are constantly added. I've been using these devices for a long time and I still watch those uh, workshops when they come out because they're always changing with every, you know, iOS update and uh, if you want to be efficient, you got to be really efficient on the ground before you can master it in flight. Yeah, and, and I believe we had a question earlier about WINGS programs, Cavalier 102.5. Many of those educational things are actually WINGS credit things because the iPad and those tools are tablet. doesn't have to be an iPad. Those are legitimate navigational tools that pilots use, and that counts towards the ground portion of your flight review. So you can go ahead and do that. Now, Pat, let's stray from the flight bag itself for a moment and talk about how we dress when we fly. Mm. And I say that because I live in the Sun Belt, you live in the Sun Belt, Kay lives in the, the greatest place in America, California. I've seen people go flying with shorts and a t-shirt and flip flops. And I always think, what if? You know, so what's, do you have a personal rule for how you dress when you go on a flight? Uh, well, first of all, I do dress. That's probably the first, <laughs> the first rule. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, Kay mentioned um, the after the crash thing. This, that was a, uh, that was an ASI, Air Safety Institute webinar that we did probably about, six or seven years ago, it was, in fact, it was called After the Crash. And one of the things that, uh, one of the sectors there, sections on there was, was how do you, how do you dress? And, and the point that, that, that the seminar made was that you, you don't dress for your point of origin or necessarily your point of destination, but dress for the terrain over which you're flying and, and the weather uh, conditions. For example, you don't, you, you know, you might be flying from, uh, uh, let's say sunny Southern California to the tip of Minnesota, and uh, it's going to get colder as you go north. Um, you know, you probably want to be dressed uh, and prepared for, for the worst should something happen over, oh, let's say St. Paul, uh, and, and when it's going to be, uh, you know, at night it's going to be, you know, probably 50 degrees, and in the winter time it's going to be a whole lot colder than that. The same thing. Um, you know, Jamie, when you fly uh, uh, across the, the sandbar, uh, you know, you, you, you probably dress for, for what could happen if you went down to the glades. And Kay, same with you. If you're flying over the, the Rockies, no, not the Rockies, but that other mountain, whatever that other mountain range is out there, um, you, you're probably kind of dressed with, you know, with a good pair of walking shoes or, you know, something in case, uh, in case you need to get out and, and do some hiking. And same thing here. Um, uh, when I'm flying around locally, of course, um, we're never very far from civilization, but if I'm flying out into West Texas, uh, to the Rio Grande Valley, Lajitas or someplace out around in there, Marfa, uh, boy, you're flying over some terrain that's just as foreboding as, 
as the worst of the terrain decay would be flying over. So uh, I'm going to be prepared uh, in whatever I'm wearing. Uh, and, you know, with regard to the flight bag, it's not really so much in the flight bag, but probably carrying a, um, a jacket or a coat of some sort, uh, maybe that space blanket. Um, uh, I might I might add to the flight bag um, if you soak some cotton balls in the Vaseline, those can be used to start fires. Uh, that Vaseline is flammable. And so mm -hmm. you can use that, you know, like that, you know, maybe one of those little trigger uh, um, activated uh, uh, match things like you, you, you'd light up a candle with, you know, that might ought to be something that you carry with you and some matches as well. Uh, and then some of these things that, that you can use to actually, you know, make fire because rubbing two sticks together is probably not, not, probably not going to do the job. Um, so, the, yeah, that's that's I would prepare just by dressing for the terrain over which I'm flying, uh, not necessarily uh, the destination or, or the point of origin. Yeah, I especially like the idea of a good pair of shoes because, you know, we we, we each live in a place where it's pretty easy to get to a really desolate location where you wouldn't go down. But there's not many pilots in America, I suspect, who are, don't ever find themselves 10 or 15 miles from civilization. And if you had to go down there for whatever reason, walking 10 or 15 miles through wooded area, through swamp, through, through rocky terrain, that's not going to be quick. So you don't want to be wearing sandals or flip-flops or whatever was comfortable in the plane. You want to have actual walking shoes. And, and I will share this. This is not just GA. My wife is an IT person for a large hotel chain, and she used to travel extensively. And one year she went to Hawaii a number of times. And one of her team showed up at the airport in February in Orlando wearing just like a Hawaiian shirt and shorts and a pair of sandals because they were going to Hawaii. He was not aware that the six hour layover at O'Hare is in a building that doesn't warm up in winter. <laughs> and it was the most miserable experience he's ever had because this is a native Floridian who's been to Hawaii, had no idea he was going to be in the Arctic for a period of time. <laughs> Okay, I'll also throw in there, and I don't think this is hyperbole, I carry food. I carry a little bit of food, you know, nuts or beef jerky, some water, because, you know, it could be, and this is not one of the happier elements of what we talk about, the, but it's possible you need to make a precautionary landing someplace. Totally under control, everything's fine, everybody walks away. But if you're a good distance away from civilization and you have no food or water, you could really be in a jam, couldn't you? Do you carry anything like that with you? I do. So I have a couple of gallons of water that I keep in the back, in the baggage that's always there, and uh, the larger size and smaller size bottles, and then uh, survival food. And this is part of the survival kit that I have. And I actually picked up my survival, which I, that I don't have. That is heavier. And I got it from uh, uh, the uh, Red Cross you can buy the basic bag from them and it's red and it has all the uh, basic, you know, survival equipment, uh, more for emergency first aid, that kind of, uh, those kind of items. And then you add supplemental items. And, and Jamie, you mentioned some of those things like the space, the space blanket and um, starting a fire. And I got this kit from, I think this might've been from one of the sporting goods stores. And, and uh, this was given to a number of Boy Scouts. I, I used to be heavily involved with volunteering for the uh, for the scouts and they put together survival kits and so this is a handy one that we take for many different uses and I keep one of these in the emergency kit uh, but those type of things are really important to to have handy and as far as water uh, I go one step further and, and I put this on my desk because this was from my flight bag I like to have Gatorade because when I drink water, it goes right through and you can't always stop to go to the bathroom. But when mm -hmm. I drink Gatorade, and something, it's something must be in the electrolytes. I don't have to go as much and it eliminates my, uh, my prone to uh, dehydration. And so this is my go-to drink. And so I keep some of these in the airplane and one that's uh, just in the cup holder next to my leg. And I, I need it, particularly in some of these temperatures that we have here, and I'm in a desert climate. 
And mm -hmm. I will also fly over very desolate areas. And the last thing I want to run out of is water because you can survive for two weeks without food, but you cannot survive without the water. So that is my number one uh, item. And then the snacks that, and all that. Yeah, I like to have those. That's a great point. And actually, Eric Pittman, two T's, offers that he carries a survival straw that filters water to make it potable. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's a really good item because it's very compact. It doesn't weigh much. But it does mean if Eric Pittman's flying along the coast where there's brackish water, but he ends up on the ground, he does have an option. And Martin Kastenbaum, I think, makes a great point. And I hadn't thought of this, but I have experienced it. Sometimes a diversion to a small airport means there's no food or water there. I've, And I'm sure we've all had that experience where we've landed at some place that wasn't our first point of intended landing. And there's nobody there at all. The building is locked and there's nothing inside and there's no phone or maybe there's no signal for your cell phone. Um, and Cavalier 102.5, I like this a lot. Uh, Kay, you know nothing about this. But did anyone mention an extra pair of eyeglasses? Pat, I do carry an extra pair, set of eyeglasses. Do you as well? Yeah. Yes, I do. Sure Outstanding. Do. I like it. Well, Cavalier has made points a couple times today. I like that. Now, Pat, I'm coming to you again. Prepare yourself. This is big. I have this fancy dancy telephone that does all kinds of remarkable things. But if the battery goes dead, it's useless. And if I'm in a place where there's no signal out in Kay's area in between mountains, is it still useful to have a cell phone with you out there? Or is that something we abandon? I don't need to bring it with me when I fly or if I end up on the ground. What's your thought? Well, I, I think it's I think it's certainly handy. You know, there are some apps on on there. Uh, for example, a compass. Um, there are compass apps on there. Of course, you have I mean, you have to orient the thing before it's usable. But uh, there are compass applications. Um, I think there's probably not a cell phone out there these days that doesn't have a flashlight built into it. Um, just just those two things alone, um, I would say, make it a, a must a must have. You bet. Yeah, I like that. And, you know, there is always the map feature. If you ended up on the ground, it's not aeronautical, but if you ended up on the ground and you could get a signal someplace, you could at least get oriented and then use the compass as a backup from there on. So, yeah, I, there are so many great tools we could use, and, and some are exotic. Some are very as simple as a pen, as, as Kay was saying. Kay, what would you like to offer to this conversation? You've been brilliant so far tonight. If you have a cell phone that you are no longer using, uh, you consider putting that in the airplane because 911 calls still go through. Ooh, Ooh, I like that. That is an excellent one. So if you have an old iPhone 5 or 6 or Android, whatever the heck they had four generations ago, you could carry that and it'll make the emergency call. I don't yes. think I knew that. I think I learned something tonight. How about you, Pat? Oh, yeah. I had no, I never thought about that. What a great idea. I am so glad I came on to this program. Ask an Ambassador has changed my life. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate it. Bill Reiner says, this is related, but I was riding an e-bike, pedal assist, at 9,000 feet when he went hypoxic. The important thing is he had no warning. And that is true. Hypoxia sometimes hits some people just like that. The cost was two broken ribs. Kay, to your point earlier, he now uses an oxygen pulse meter, and I'll bet he would love to have one of those canisters of oxygen. And by the way, I didn't ask you before, how would somebody get a hold of one of those? Do they have to go to the oxygen survival store, or no, are those you, widely available? You can get this at CVS, at Walgreens. I think Target sells them. I'm not sure about regular grocery stores, but... Uh, they are readily accessible. And this can is, I think it was like $10, maybe $12. We're not talking a whole lot of money. And I do have larger sizes. I like the smaller one for my flight bag. I have the larger one that's in the airplane. Mm. Um, Cecilia Adamson says a garbage bag can be turned into a raincoat, which is very true. And because I was a Boy Scout long ago, I know it can also be turned into a flotation device. Mm -hmm. It's a little squiggly, but, you know, Hey, when, when you're down to it, that's worth knowing. So I think, in all honesty, I like what's in my flight bag, and I'm guessing you guys like what's in your flight bag. 
I really am basically I'm down to absolute necessity navigation items, things that comfort me emotionally should an emergency happen, and those electronic devices like the personal locator beacon or the handheld that really might get me out of trouble days faster rather than, you know, for that, let's just talk for a moment about the cost factor because pilots are notoriously cheap and they're always trying to save a dollar, which is why my internet connection looks like this. But <laughs> is that personal locator beacon or that handheld radio, which they cost a couple hundred bucks, is that a cost-effective purchase in your mind, Pat? Is that worth laying out a couple hundred bucks for that item? This uh, this specific one was two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Now it was. This is coming up on probably four years old. Maybe maybe getting closer to five. I just re-registered the two-year thing for the uh, for Sarsat, um, but uh, and I think now they're up to. 300 and some change, but, you know, come five years from now or come the time to, to buy another one or replace the battery, I won't think twice about it. It will, it will get done. So I think that those things are, are well worth, uh, well worth the investment. You bet. I'm with you. I, I actually think, I, I think of it as an insurance policy. I hope to never use it, but it's in my bag and it's available. And if I ever need it, it literally could save my life because there have been people who have just disappeared and, you know, yeah. they, they're found years later and they survived the crash. They just couldn't get out of there. Okay. Let's ask the same thing about the handheld radio. Some people think, well, I've got two radios in the airplane, so it's not a problem. Do we really need the handheld radio or do you think that's worth the expenditure and the weight and the aggravation of making sure it's charged or is that just unnecessary? I think it's absolutely necessary. And now the price point has really come down. You can get just a basic calm handheld for $200. Mm -hmm. Now you will actually get that money back little by little if you use that before you start the engine. I tell my students, get the ATIS before you start the engine. No, you're saving a few minutes here or there and it adds up over time. And so my students are all in the habit of always getting the ATIS before they start. Uh, and if you're renting an airplane, you know, it's not going to be 0.1, but you do that a couple of times a week. Yes, it's going to be definitely 0.1 of the rental cost, right? And then you do that another, multiply that by 40, there's your cost of your handheld. You've already uh, earned that money back. So that's one. But the number two, uh, it's, it's just in my airspace, uh, if you have a lost comm, it's not an emergency. But it is so much more convenient if you have that handheld. And, and I also tell rusty pilots, get the handheld and go out to the airport and listen to the communications because uh, radio communications is one of the, the main items that are, that's really intimidating to rusty pilots. And so that handheld serves multiple purposes, but uh, I think it's well worth the cost. You know, I got to admit, I've had a handheld for many years and I've always thought it was worth the expense just in case I ever needed it. And I, you know, years ago I had a, an electrical failure. I did not have a handheld and I really wished I did. But where I really hadn't thought of it being practical was when I bought that Cub, which has no electrical system, but it did have an external antenna. And I could just plug it into my handheld and stick it in the seat pocket. And I now have communications out of my little cub. And man, when you're flying around, even non-towered airport where it's not required, that's a real comfort that I, I know what's going on. It's not just being able to see the other traffic. I know. And I got my money's worth that way. But I never even thought of get the ATIS before you start up because you've saved that time. And you're right. O over a period of a year or two. You're going to save the cost of that handheld for sure. That's great. I really like that. By the way, Jorge Nelson Felix is, is visiting us from Buenos Aires, Argentina. So we have someone from the UK. We have someone from Argentina, somebody all the way from Tennessee. And I'm pretty sure there's a couple Texans on the line. So uh, this is pretty impressive, don't you think? I think so. 
<laughs> this has just been great. Folks watching, those of you who are still there, whether you're in the UK or Argentina or Tennessee or Texas, give me a thumbs up. If anybody tonight said something that was worthwhile to you, and I'm really looking forward to sending out this hat. So I hope I see an email at ambassadors at AOPA.org. And by the way, if you have a question after this, or if you feel like one of us led you astray, or you want to compliment us in a private setting so you don't embarrass us in front of everyone, please do write to ambassadors at AOPA.org. We actually do see those emails. We really do answer them. We enjoy doing this more than I can say. Maybe Pat could say more. And, you know, we've only got four minutes left. Pat. So let me throw it to you for a 37, 39 seconds. Uh, <laughs> is there anything you want to share on this or any other topic before we let these fine people go about their lives? Well, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, uh, <laughs> actually not really. Um, take a look at your flight bag. Uh, I always just take, say, take a personal inventory, take a look at the things that you have in it. You know, if you've had some batteries that have been in there for six months or eight months or something like that, you probably ought to think about changing those things out because over time uh, they they will go bad. Um, if you carry an extra headset, uh, probably not a, the best idea to store those batteries in the electronic uh, uh, control thing of the headset because uh, if they do leak, and that's one of the reasons that I just got this back from Bose, is because I didn't listen to my own advice, and uh, and the, the battery acid uh, damaged the, the control unit. Um, anyway, uh, probably not the best thing to do is store, store these things with batteries in them, uh, and then make sure you've got plenty of, of uh, fresh batteries when you do go out, because those batteries have been in your flight bag for six months, eight months, a year. They, they may not end up doing you much good. Kay, you are so much cooler than I am and fly such a remarkable aircraft while I fly a little Cessna 152, which I love, but it is a weight-challenged machine. So I actually do weigh my flight bag periodically because over time it changes in weight. And, you know, I've got stuff in there and, and I want to know what the weight and balance of that airplane is. Do you have a method or do you guess or do you do like I do and every once in a while you weigh it or what's your thing? I do wait, particularly when I go on longer trips and I have baggage with me. I always have a, a small overnight bag. I know you put some of your clothes in your flight bag. and No, no, I need some more things. It won't fit in my flight bag. So I have a separate overnight little roller bag that stays in the baggage compartment. But on longer flights, um, I'll have a regular suitcase or if I have a passenger with me. And so I'll use uh, one of the apps in, on, on my iPad and... I will put in, hey, this is, I know that the, the weight of the emergency equipment is, you know, 30 pounds, and I'll put that in there and exactly where it's located. And same with the other bags. Um, it's not very often that I'm flying right at uh, max gross weight, but you need to do the weight and balance. And so I just use the app on my iPad, and uh, you, you set it up once, and then you just plug and chug as each flight does vary depending on where you're going. And, you know, it, it's a very simple formula to figure out what that flight bag weighs. You just pack it, pick it up, step on the scale. Step off, put that bag down, step back on the scale, subtract the first number from the second, or the second number from the first number, and now you, you I don't know what I'm doing. Subtract <laughs> the second number from the first number, then you have the weight of the bag. And um, I'm going to try and do that so much better for the repeats. You know, this live one, we're just messing around. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your participation tonight. Thank you very much to Rebecca Boone, ensconced way at the top of the Eiffel Tower where the light radiates out and her beauty just spreads across the city and she has done a wonderful job. Thank you for coming and visiting with us tonight. Even Eric Pittman with the two T's. And by the way, we should start a two T team because I have two T's as well. Um, and yes, Jamie needs math class. You are correct. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kay. Wonderful job. You passed on some terrific information tonight that, frankly, I had never even thought of. Pat, you were perfectly adequate. I don't think there's <laughs> anything to make fun of you for. I had a great time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Come see us on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Next time we'll be here on September 13th, which is a magical night. You just know it is. So come on back, 4 o'clock Pacific. 7 o'clock Eastern, some other time in the middle, second Tuesday, September 13th. We'll see you then.
Come on back. Good night. Good night.